Good morning, everybody. Thank you for coming. I'm setting a timer. I wasn't playing with my telephone. Um, just I want to make sure we stay on time and leave plenty of time for questions. So what I thought I'd do over the next 25 minutes or so is uh, go over the evaluation and management of the small renal mass. That, this may not apply to many of you who are here as survivors, uh, but yet now you are a de facto source of information for your family and friends also who may come to you with their own personal um, dilemmas uh, if they're diagnosed with a tumor in their kidneys. So hopefully this will provide some background information for you. I'll spend a little bit of time on evaluation and really focus on um, uh, manage management aspects. So in terms of evaluation briefly, what we as a standard baseline like to do is get a history and physical. Talk to patients. Uh, we want to look for other signs and symptoms that may need additional workup. Uh, in terms of a small renal mass, they are invariably nearly all silent. Uh, they're usually caught incidentally. So really what we're also trying to look for with the history and physical is to assess overall health, what we call competing risks, I'll tell you what that means, and tolerance for anesthesia and surgery. If you mind, don't mind, I'm just going to check one thing here to make the pointer more friendly. There we go. <clears throat> We'd like to get a scan of the abdomen. Uh, that's where the kidney is. So uh, if there's not one, if there's, for example, just a simple ultrasound, we'd like to get something more detailed with a contrast-enhanced CT or MRI. We don't really have to cover the pelvic portion in many cases, and in fact, insurance will refuse to pay for it. Or if what was done, sometimes they'll not reimburse that. So in today's age of uh, much more attention to uh, cost, uh, that is just one little detail to point out. And then we like to look at the chest, either with a simple chest x-ray or, if indicated, a CT scan, because kidney cancer, as many of you might know, it likes to go to the lung more so than anywhere else. Very unlikely to do that in the case of a small tumor in the kidney, but still it's just a baseline evaluation. And a chest x-ray, pretty simple thing, fairly low radiation exposure. And then we get blood work, primarily to look at the metabolic profile, and more importantly, to get the serum creatinine level, which we can use to calculate kidney function, which we call the estimated glomerular filtration rate, or GFR, which gives us an idea of what the overall kidney function is. So I mentioned this idea of competing risks, and it's something that we're much more aware of now than we were, let's say, 20 years ago, where we sort of had a one-size-fits-all approach to people with, to patients with kidney cancer. And the idea here is that there are a variety of factors out there trying to kill patients. Um, one of them is the tumor, and if it's cancer, it could grow. Uh, worst case scenario, it can spread and become incurable. Of course, that's part of our goal is to try to avoid that. And in the process of growing, maybe it would destroy more kidney and, and patients would lose more kidney function. On the other hand, what's pulling on your life are these comorbidities, diabetes, high blood pressure, heart disease, strokes, etc. And so with that, there is a risk of us intervening because maybe there's silent heart disease that's undiagnosed. We don't want to go in and treat something and have you risk getting a heart attack because we didn't think thoroughly enough about that. There's the idea that maybe what we're going to do isn't really going to help you from a cancer perspective because there's so many other medical conditions that that's really what's going to be the end of life. Um, and then secondly, the issue of things like diabetes or kidney stones harming kidney function already. And on top of that, if we're going to intervene, then we may cause more loss of kidney function. So these are some of, a few <clears throat> of the competing risks that we consider when we're seeing patients. So how does that translate to real life? Um, here's a study that looked at patients who were treated for a small tumor and then looked at their comorbidity status. So how sick were they? So a Charleston zero means they're pretty healthy. A Charleston three plus means, you know what, they've got a lot of medical conditions. So what's their survival of these different groups like? I'm not going to look at the bigger tumors. Let's just focus on this row. And what you're going to see is blue and red. Blue means the risk of dying from non-kidney cancer causes. Look at how overwhelming that blue is compared to the red. The red is the risk of dying from treated kidney cancer. Not that they watched it, but they got treated. But the point is that once it's treated, the risk of dying of kidney cancer is so incredibly small compared to the overall, overall other risk. 
And it makes you wonder that maybe some of these patients did not necessarily have to have treatment for this, um, especially once you get to these issues, to these patients who have many more comorbidities and have such a much higher risk of dying. Now, if you look down here with a smaller tumor in a healthy patient, you can see that the risk of dying of kidney cancer is almost equal to dying from uh, non-kidney uh, cancer causes. So obviously the risk-benefit ratio there is different. But again, we're just focusing on the small tumor mass, which we define as those being less than four centimeters. So the other factor is that we're born with a tremendous amount more kidney function when we're infants and toddlers and teenagers, but we lose it over time. As we get older, just aging processes, and then if you add to that diabetes and high blood pressure, then you lose it even more quickly. And unfortunately, unlike the liver and lizard tails, we don't regenerate kidneys. Okay, that would be a huge advance if somebody figured that out. But kidneys don't really regenerate. So once it's gone, it's gone. The other question that we get is, you know, why do I have to have this injection during my scan? Uh, do we really need it? And um, here's to give you a couple of examples of, as to how big of a difference it can make. Here's a patient I actually saw just recently, and initially they thought uh, the patient had a kidney stone, so they got a scan. What they see is a cyst in the kidney, no big deal. We don't really worry about those. There's a little something here, but this is a non-contrast study. It's basically like going in a dark room and trying to make things out when it's sort of like everything's kind of dark. When we give contrast, it lights up the blood vessels, it lights up portions of the kidney, and tumors tend to light up either more slowly or more quickly than the rest of the kidney, so then we can tell what's going on. So suddenly you see that there's something here. The cyst is there, it's much more pronounced. We don't, we're not really worried about the cyst, but now we see this tumor. And to just get a little bit more um, detailed with you, it's not just even about giving contrast, but it's about doing the scan in a proper way so that the timing is done well. So that's why sometimes when patients come see us, we emphasize, look, we want to get a scan here, or we have to repeat your scan, or your scan wasn't quite what we needed when they're done elsewhere. And it has to do with these important details where the devil lives, because then if you skip it, then you may miss something. And so here's another example. Here's a non-contrast study. You see a couple of little things going on here, but overall the kidney looks kind of normal. When we give contrast, that you know, there, you see this black spot, you see this looks a little funny, and this is done in an earlier phase after the contrast is given. Maybe this is done about four or five minutes after the injection. But then if you give it a little bit more time and let that contrast circulate and just sort of um, uh, equally distribute through the tissues, then we get a better picture of what's going on. And suddenly, this was nothing. This is just some fat inside the kidney. But lo and behold, there's a tumor there in the kidney that was completely not seen and not really well. So this could have easily been skipped. The radiologist easily could have missed it. Any of us could have missed it. But now it's really well defined where it is. Okay. And the other thing I wanted to show you is that the scans don't really help us differentiate between kidney cancers, the most common being clear cell or papillary. And they don't really help us distinguish that from benign tumors, such as oncocytoma or metanephric adenoma, which is an unusual one that we sometimes see. They all pretty much look the same on CT scan, with some rare exceptions. For example, sometimes we can kind of guess, semi in educated fashion, that it's a papillary kidney cancer. So just to give you some of that baseline. So we talked about considerations, kidney function, patient's health and vitality, competing risks, and then we'll talk about treatment options and some of the clinical guidelines that are out there. And then I'm going to close up with surveillance after treatment. So we have certain guidelines from uh, societies. There's the uh, American Neurological Association, AUA. There's the National Comprehensive Cancer Network, NCCN. And then there's the uh, European Association of Urology, the EAU. The point I want to make about this is that the guidelines that these, have, these groups have proposed, you'll see a lot of similarity. There's some subtle differences. They're not based on hard evidence. Uh, they're based on a group of people coming together in a room, and it's consensus because we don't have great, high-quality scientific evidence. And what I mean by high-quality is like a ton of randomized studies, for example. We have very few of these in kidney cancer, actually, especially surgical management. So a lot of times it's based on the strongest personality of, in the room or the most senior person, and, and how those discussions go, and that's what we call consensus. 
So in terms of the uh, American Urological Association guidelines that um, uh, I was a part of and helped develop in 2009, at the time we considered partial nephrectomy a standard approach, which means this is pretty much, uh, you know, top tier choice. Radical nephrectomy was also standard because we couldn't achieve uh, agreement on whether it should be maybe a level lower you know, because we'd lose much more kidney function with that. And then active surveillance or ablation um, was given as a recommendation, which is yet a step lower of a uh, uh, guideline. And then an option is really like bottom. It's like, yeah, you have this option, but, you know, kind of really, can you please think about it, <laughs> is what that means. These are all euphemisms um, in terms of uh, providing guidance to the urologist. The NCCN is a little bit more clear. They prefer a partial nephrectomy for a small kidney tumor, a radical nephrectomy only if a partial is not feasible, surveillance in selected patients, and ablation in patients who aren't surgical candidates, and somewhat similar for the European guidelines. So those are some of the options that we're going to talk about next. Um, we're not really going to, at the very end, I'll talk about radical nephrectomy very briefly, where we remove the whole tumor. And it's still an option for very big tumors or people with multiple tumors in a kidney. But <clears throat> I'll talk about open partial nephrectomy, robotic partial nephrectomy, which we're doing more and more often, uh, ablative therapy, and also uh, active surveillance. And we'll actually go in this order. So that's a lot of options. And so hopefully I haven't. Uh, lost you, and if I have, I'll make it clear by the time we're done. Before we get to those, the other question that comes up is what's the role of biopsy? That frequently comes up. Uh, patients who have dealt with cancer before frequently ask. Uh, for patients who haven't and it's their first exposure to medicine, they, they're worried that maybe the biopsy is going to spread cancer and we have to allay those fears. Uh, traditionally, what we have done biopsy for is to rule out maybe spread to the kidney from something else, like lymphoma, or if the patient, for example, has another cancer, and now that we find something in the kidney, we worry maybe it's spread to the kidney. So biopsy in that setting is pretty good, and for decades we had considered that an option. To use it to diagnose what the actual tumor of the kidney is, is not something that we've felt confident with until the past few years because techniques have gotten better. Both the biopsy techniques have gotten better, but it's also on the other side, sort of in the back door, uh, behind the back door, where the pathologists are working, they've gotten better at being able to tell what these different tumors are. Because not only do they look the same on CT scan, and they look very similar when we cut into them and look at them, even under the microscope, sometimes they can look similar. And again, that devil is in the details for them to be able to pick apart those specific uh, factors which identify them as cancers or benign tumors. So things have gotten much better over the past, I would say within the past 10 years, maybe even a little bit less. I think your accuracy is probably around 90%, depending which institution you look at, a little bit higher, a little lower. Occasionally, you still get a non-diagnosis non from a biopsy, but much less frequently than we used to. And of course, with contemporary techniques, we really don't see this issue of it spreading any cancer. There is some risk of bleeding. That risk is pretty low in good hands. The other little important detail is that there's a couple of different biopsy types. In areas where not, they're not very comfortable with doing this, all they do is basically an aspiration, which means all they're doing is sucking out some fluid from inside the tumor, because this way they can use a tiny little needle, and the risk of bleeding is less, and they're less nervous about it. The problem with that is, is that it gives the pathologist, who is, then has the obligation of trying to diagnose this, very little tissue to go with. And so with that, you, it's not unusual to get a non-diagnostic result. They say, well, the cancers look blue. <laughs> so it could be cancer, it could be not cancer. Um, so it, it's hard for them to tell. With a larger needle, they can actually get some more tissue. And so not only does a pathologist have more tissue at that point, but they can actually do these um, new chemical stains uh, that color different molecules, different colors, and those molecules are associated with either cancer or benign tumors, and they can actually do panels of six or eight of them. And then based on the combination of those, they can actually, with pretty good confidence, say, hey, this is cancer, this is not cancer. So biopsy is pretty good for certain things. It can tell us, for example, um, clear cell type versus the non-clear cell type of kidney cancer. It's not quite as good for telling high versus low grade. And then if you want the exact grade, like one, two, three, four, that gets pretty bad. 
And then if you want to look for the rare, very aggressive variant, like what we call sarcomatoid, it's really not good for that. So you have to think about what you're looking for and order it appropriately. And there are, we don't do it in every patient, but sometimes we consider it when we think it makes a difference. And here's an example. Here's an elderly patient that I saw, very poor kidney function. Uh, patients usually think of GFR as a percentage. It's really not. Uh, but it helps to think of it that way if, if you want to. It's reasonable to say that the patient has about 30% kidney function compared to normal. And it's a tumor that we found, incidentally, that really is a size where we're not too comfortable watching it. Uh, so we, discovered, we discussed doing a biopsy, and it was done under MRI. You don't really see the metal because it doesn't show up on MRI. But they did both an FNA, an aspiration, and again, we don't, did not get a diagnostic result from that. But they also did a biopsy where they got tissue and they did multiple stains. And what they're favoring is an oncocytoma. It looked like an oncocytoma, and the stains confirmed that this was consistent with one. So we got a pretty confident diagnosis. This is a benign tumor. It's not going to spread. It's not going to harm the patient, except that it may grow over time. It may. So we kind of want to keep an eye on it. Um, but the bottom line was that we felt very comfortable telling the patient, you know what, I don't think you need to have anything done. Why don't you come back in a year and we'll take a look at it and make sure that it's not going to harm your kidney function. So it can make a difference depending on the right setting. So it goes to this idea of active surveillance for certain patients. Now that was a benign tumor, not a cancer. And so when we do active surveillance quite frequently, we're doing it either for known or presumed Kid, small kidney cancers. And this was something that started to be popularized in the late 90s. We did not have much information before then because basically somebody showed up with a tumor in the kidney, it didn't matter how big it was, that kidney was out. <laughs> and so we learned over the time that, you know, maybe we don't have to remove all of these and maybe we're harming more patients by destroying their kidney function when we do that. And in fact, multiple, multiple studies have been published, even more than what I show you on the slide. And what these slopes show was the rate of growth of these tumors. And on average, what we see is about a 0.25 to 0.45 centimeter uh, growth per year. So we take that upper limit of that, 0.5 centimeters, as sort of the maximum we're willing to accept when we're watching these tumors. The other piece of information that I'm not showing you is server, certain, several studies that show that when cancers are less than 3 centimeters, their likelihood of spread is exceedingly low. Doesn't mean it doesn't happen. It just means that the likelihood is so low, it's probably less than 1%. <clears throat> and so for these smaller tumors, we're fairly confident that we can usually watch them, at least for some time, depending on the patient's scenario, if we need to. Um, and so generally, and in, in if, if we look at the overall uh, publications, a 2% rate of metastatic disease, but then if you look at these cases, they are all, you know, most of them are bigger tumors, they weren't exactly less than three centimeters and some other factors. Um, and of course, it's uh, associated, again, larger tumors and those that grew more quickly were the ones that were bad players. So you do have to keep an eye on it. This is our own data. Uh, somewhere around 2006, 2007, we started a registry for patients that we put on active surveillance. And this shows actually the growth of tumors over the course of two years. Each little column here is a tumor, single tumor and how much it grew over the course of two years. You can see that the overwhelming majority uh, grew one centimeter or less within the course of two years. There are a few bad players that we caught along the way and we had to intervene. You can see that some of them even shrink for reasons that we don't fully understand. So the other question that comes up is, is it, is it risky to delay management? And again, metastatic disease, at least in our situation, is exceedingly unlikely. And if we do have to intervene, we usually haven't burnt a bridge. We still have all these options available. And whether it grows or not doesn't tell you if it's cancer. We see cancers not grow, and we have benign tumors that we biopsy that we know are benign, and those will grow. So the fact that it doesn't grow or does grow doesn't tell you much about what it is. So it's a pretty reasonable treatment option for very select patients. If either they're unfit for surgery, there's competing risks. We have a few that just flat out refuse surgery, so we watch it. It does require personalization, and the patients do have to agree to come back to get it followed up. I want to spend a couple of minutes talking about ablation, and with that I mean either freezing the tumor with cryoablation or heating it to very high degrees using radio frequencies. Cryoablation has been around much longer, and the idea there is that basically we can puncture the tumor with a specialized probe 
This shows it being done laparoscopically, although the majority of these uh, we now do percutaneously. An interventional radiologist who's our collaborator uh, puts it through the skin while the patient's asleep under MRI or CT and can guide it right into the tumor. And basically what you get is an ice ball that essentially destroys all that tissue. And then we leave everything there and then what we have to do is basically get scans over about three of them over the, over the course of the first year. This shows the tumor beforehand. At one month, you see how the kidney is white. There's contrast, but there's no white in the area that we treated, meaning there's no blood flow, no blood flow, no life. So that's good in this case. And over time, what we'd like to see is that the area not only does it have no blood flow, that it, but that it shrinks. And that gives us confidence that it's fully treated. Radiofrequency ablation is the same idea, except it heats the tissue. And this is, um, uh, this shows these, this umbrella-shaped wires are what actually, we, it withdraws in this. We, we put the probe in and then we uh, expose those wires and that what's, that's what causes the radiofrequencies. You see a bunch of steam being generated because it's heating up the tumor to very high degrees. And then that's it, once we think we've gotten the whole thing, again, we um, actually, this shows it being done percutaneously through the skin without even any surgery. And then same thing, no blood flow, and over time we'd like to see it shrink. So we have to get scans afterward. That's one downside of doing this procedure. Uh, the other downside is that even though the results are pretty good, these numbers are not quite as good as surgery as I'm going to show you. Um, but that's also in the short term because uh, when we did these analyses, we did not have long-term follow-up like we had with surgery. So the techniques have gotten better also over time. So we reserve this for that reason for elderly patients or who, those who are higher risk uh, and maybe we have to intervene. A lot of times I'm treating patients who have, were on active surveillance and the tumors are growing and patients are nervous and they say, you know what, I think I want to get it treated and we're still kind of worried about their medical situation, so then we fall back on this option. And there has to be a verbal agreement to all of these factors with the patient in terms of the biopsy before, possibly after, and then making sure they come back for follow-up. The one thing that does not relate to small kidney tumors, and you may hear about it later today from one of our medical oncologists and what we're very excited about, this idea that we can kill the tumor and keep it in place, what happens is you're creating this tremendous inflammation and an opportunity for your immune system to maybe start recognizing that there's a cancer there. Because up until that point, the cancer has been able to create this immunogenic wall where it doesn't allow the body to recognize it. So we actually have this clinical trial that just opened. Um, and the idea was fairly novel, uh, although novel in that we were able to get it approved and done. Um, uh, but it's something we've, a lot of people have been trying to do. But the idea that patients with metastatic disease, we can actually perform ablation in one area where the tumor is, and then give them these new, this new generation of um, uh, immune compounds that basically allows the immune system to unleash its force against the rest of the cancers. And so we have this uh, trial that's opening up, and it's basically after the treatment is done, we go in and remove the primary kidney tumor, and then we continue the treatment uh, with the immunogenic compound uh, afterward if we see that there's a benefit. I want to spend the next couple of minutes talking about partial nephrectomy. It's a very good option, um, and it's we can, what we consider the reference. This is an example of a patient with a, essentially a solitary functioning kidney. The other kidney was shrunken down, not working well, was sent to me with this large tumor. And uh, in cases like this, we can really do a complex but quite effective partial removal, be able to preserve the majority of the kidney. And uh, as it turns out, actually, that was a benign tumor. The patient's kidney function was totally unchanged. Here's another situation of a tumor that's deep inside the kidney, surrounded by critical structures. This is where the urine's collecting. The blue arrows show where the tumor is. Here's again the tumor, a different view. This is the urinary collecting system. And then there's also, in, in these red arrows, point out all the blood vessels surrounding the tumor. So that patient was given the option of attempting a complicated partial removal versus removing the whole kidney, and the patient wanted to have the kidney try to be preserved. And that's what we did. Um, it's a fairly complex uh, approach. We have to do ultrasound to see exactly where the tumor is because we don't see any surface landmarks. We then have to start doing this micro dissection of the blood vessels and the collecting system away from the tumor. And then we actually stop the blood supply to the kidney. That's why the kidney looks pale here. 
And then this way we can work in a bloodless field while we're cutting through the kidney and make sure with every cut that we're not getting into tumor. And here it is, you don't even see any cancer because it's all surrounded by normal tissue. And what we can do is preserve the majority of the kidney. This shows the kidney after the tumor's been removed, blood vessels that are tied off. And then we reconstructed, reestablished the blood flow. You can see the pink kidney's nice and pink. This is what the cancer looked like. It was a clear cell renal cell carcinoma. And you say, yeah, that's all fine and good. How did this patient do? Well, this is the CT scan six years later. She's doing great. Okay, no evidence of recurrence of the kidney or anywhere else. And we can do this for very complex cases, solitary kidney with very big tumors, if the anatomy is appropriate, or in cases of genetic syndromes where there's multiple bilateral tumors uh, and, and try to do these complex resections. So it is the reference standard, and we have very good data showing that it's extremely effective, and it's a good cancer operation. In the old days, we used to make these huge incisions. Not necessary. Most days, uh, most of the time, uh, we can really do these through fairly small incisions. Truth is, it's still, you know, an incision that is probably not the nicest for the patient. And so what's happened over the past several years is these minimally invasive approaches, laparoscopy initially, now robotic laparoscopic surgery, where we can actually perform a lot of these uh, through smaller incisions. This is done with a machine that allows us to do the surgery in a more effective and simpler fashion. The surgeon sits separately while an assistant helps at the bedside. The surgeon's looking at this three-dimensional view and with these controls uh, has the ability to manipulate these micro-wristed instruments that are attached to this part of the machine and that they're inserted through these punctures into the body. This machine does not operate independently, so the surgeon on the other side really needs to know what they're doing. Uh, and it's, in fact, a little bit more complex than doing open surgery and requires more training. I'm going to skip over this video because I have a couple of others. Uh, but we can also do some of these complicated approaches with the microdissection. Here's a tumor that's in close proximity to the blood vessels of the kidney. This video is sped up, so it looks like I'm working super fast. I don't work that fast. Chris Wood might work that fast. I don't. Uh, but uh, basically what it's showing is uh, dissection of these blood vessels away from the tumor. You don't even see it because it's covered. we kept, keep the fat covering it. And then we can basically, over time, when, with additional dissection, essentially then remove just that diseased part of the kidney, have minimal blood loss, and feel very confident about the resection. And we've done this many, many times, very complicated cases. Patients are sent to us, or they come to us saying they can't save my kidney. Can you think you can remove the tumor? And quite frequently, we can. And sometimes we can do this robotically, even. So all cases that we've done robotic partial removal with negative margins and very good outcomes. So, so far we think that it replicates open partial nephrectomy. It's a good minimally invasive option. Surgeon experience, again, is much more important than the machine that's used, okay? That's, the machine is just an enabling tool. To finish up, uh, you know, radical nephrectomy, not really a role for small renal tumors. In fact, they're one of the few randomized studies done in this disease. Um, was looking at doing a radical versus partial nephrectomy for tumors less than five centimeters. This was done in Europe. They only accrued 541 patients out of the 1,300 that they were supposed to uh, enroll. The problem was that very few patients actually died of kidney cancer over the course of nine years. Most patients died of cardiovascular disease. Um, and there was a lot of limitations from this study. So basically, after all of this work and all of this effort, um, there's unfortunately not much we can get away with in terms of information with this, except to say that we th think they're about the same, so why aren't we saving more kidneys? Uh, we did a, a, a patient-reported outcome study here. It's one of the largest ones done. The point I want to make about that, uh, so what's unique about this is that we actually asked patients about how things went, and not just asked them in clinic, but we had these standardized questionnaires. And the point I want to make is that what patients really worry about most um, is really after one year, they don't care about the scar so much, they really worry about cancer recurrence. And so the minimally invasive options are great options for the short term, and um, you know, for the long term, we just need to think a little bit more globally. And it's important for us to think about that because sometimes, we sometimes put, maybe put too much value on how much, you, how much you care about your scars or some of the pain after surgery. But really maybe what we need to consider is what happens one year later or three years later. 
There's really no role for removal of lymph nodes after, in terms of small renal tumors. I'm going to skip over this. If you have questions about it, we can go over the Q&A portion. Um, surveillance, I'm going to skip also because I'm at 30 minutes, actually, and I don't want to go over. Um, but basically, it's based on the theory that if we catch recurrence of cancer early, that maybe patients will do better. Believe it or not, we don't really have any studies that prove that. But in our heart of hearts, we feel that it does make a difference, and I know you do too. But actually, there's not, not much scientific literature for that. So bottom line is that what we want to do is do a risk-adapted approach. Patients who are low risk try to minimize the burden of, of radiation and cost and time. Uh, but for those who have higher risk, try to catch the recurrences early. And so there's AUA guidelines that make recommendations. They're not perfect. We may be missing up to 30% of recurrences. But many of us feel that maybe they're also misguided because there are way too many scans for the low-risk patients and not enough for the high-risk patients. And then there's the cost issue. So I'm going to finish uh, just to tell you that basically the idea with all these options is that we can really individualize care, whereas 15 years ago we didn't. It was a one-size-fits-all approach. And so we think we're delivering better care and really approach this in a much more global way for the patient. Thank you.